Welcome to Toastmasters Beta Bay, where we feature speakers from San Francisco to Monterey. My name is Tony de Toastmaster de Leon. Happy Halloween to everyone. Tonight, I am your Toastmaster, or your ghost, well, I mean your host for tonight's show. Today, I went on a computer and did a search on the top fear in the United States. And do you know, it's still public speaking. Toastmasters is a way of overcoming your fear of public speaking in a cheerful, friendly environment and also leadership skills to boot. Today, we're going to feature some parts of a typical Toastmasters meeting. We will have table topics where Toastmasters in the audience will tackle questions without preparation. We will also have a prepared speech and an evaluation at speech and we will also feature one of our clubs in District 4. We will start with table topics. I will throw out a question and invite an audience member to answer it. They will have two minutes to answer that question without any preparation. So question number one, it's Halloween at work. The decision is to dress up or not dress up, and why? Linda. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. There is no question. You must dress up. Halloween is one of those holidays that you get to fully experience. And yes, I have been the one the only one to dress up at work, but I dress up every year because I love Halloween. You get to be somebody else, anybody else. You see, one time at work, we had themes by department, and our department was going to be angels. Angels for Halloween? Luckily, I knew somebody who was a hell's angel. <laughs> and I showed up, and everybody looks at me like, but we're supposed to be angels. I said, I am. <laughs> it was wonderful. You, you got to put some fun into it. You got to have fun with Halloween. And I think here today, we are proving that. So happy Halloween, Toastmasters. Halloween is a time to let your imagination run wild and come up with some fun, crazy stories. You're running, running, running. You're sweating profusely. Jennifer, tell me the rest of the story. <laughs> I want to tell you about Halloween, how Halloween got started. I think, I believe Halloween is a blending of folk laws and some religious um, rituals. It started, I believe, with the ancient Celts. And what they used to celebrate New Year's on uh, no, November 1st. And, and October 1st is the day before New Year. And that's also the day that the dead can come back to Earth. So what did the Celts do to have the ghost not haunt them and not do evil things onto them? They dressed up like I am doing right now in this devil's costume. And they also lay out food for the ghost so that the ghost wouldn't bother them. And they also would have a, a plentiful harvest for the next year. So there you have it. That's the story that I'm telling. And now I've got to run and tell this story to another group. 
<laughs> Thank you for the triple T. Uh, <laughs> Earlier, I mentioned the number one fear in America is public speaking. Jack, in your opinion, tell me about number two and why. <laughs> <laughs> Second biggest fear. Uh, this is PG-13. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Table Topics Master, fellow Toastmasters, and welcome to guests. The the second fear in Halloween, okay. Well, my greatest fear, I don't know if it's Halloween or not, is paying taxes every year. <laughs> <laughs> not so much the paying the taxes, it's not having the money and trying to explain, why don't you have the money? Because I had to buy stuff. So, to me, that's a pretty big fear because of the ramifications of not having the bucks and the, the tax man comes in and goes, pay me, and you're going, ah, I can't. And he turns around and says, okay, what can I take from you? And you're thinking, don't touch anything. But to me personally, that's, that's a, just running out of money in this time and, and day and age of jobs going, jobs shifting overseas, and all of us being laid off and just not knowing really where our next buck is coming from and to pay the tax man. Mr. Table Topics Master. Thank you, Jack. You've just been invited to a Halloween party, and you know you got to come in costume. Decision is, do you want to be cute, or do you want to be scary? Birget, tell me why. <laughs> when I was growing up, I was always in dance recitals. So essentially, I was dressing up all the time. We had these little tutus. Even for tap, I never could figure this out. Even for tap dancing, they put us in a tutu when I was seven years old. And we did this, I still remember this. I am a coffee pot. Da, 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 da. I still remember part of that routine that's really infinitely scary. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I want to be scary. But the thing is, I grew up always having these cute little costumes for recitals. Well, the thing is, after a while, you couldn't drag me into a tutu anymore. Because the thing is, I never did the little Princess Disney thing. First of all, because, you know, Belle and the Little Mermaid didn't exist. I'm totally dating myself. But the thing is, I was always dressed like that on stage anyway. So my favorite costume, actually, when I was a kid, wasn't all that scary. But it was anything but a princess. I was a hobo. I had all of these different patch patches. I had a cap and I had something slung over my shoulder, a little bag, so I was kind of walking along. That's got to be my absolute favorite costume. So the answer to the question is, I think I'd rather be scary. But the thing is, I think I'd rather dress up somehow so that people couldn't recognize me. Now, I don't like masks. I don't like the idea of pulling something over a mask. Because first of all, when you're wearing a mask, what ends up happening is you look like every other person that purchased the same mask. And I'm sorry, I want to be unique. So I don't want to really be wearing the mask. But you can be scary without being a mask. You could do the wild hair thing, right? You could have you know, the wild accoutrements. You could be scary. You could have horns. You could have Hell's Angels jackets. You can incorporate all of that. So I think I would really much, much rather come in there and be scary. But see if I could somehow twist that a little bit to make sure that people don't recognize me right away. Because that way you can kind of sneak around and see what they're saying about you. Because <laughs> they think they're talking behind your back. And that's what really scares them when you say, hey, that's me. <laughs> so table Topics Master. Thank you. That concludes Table Topics. Now it's time to learn about one of our over 200 clubs here in District 4. This club is for you if you like to get up early in the morning. Let's have a visit with Redwood Orators. I'm a member of Redwood City Orators and we meet at 7 a.m. on Friday mornings. Well, our club does have a theme and it's called Dare to Speak at 7 a.m. So we dare people to come and speak at 7 a.m. And the fact that we meet at 7 a.m. in the morning is, for me, a, a really helpful thing because it means that it never conflicts with my day. Good morning, fellow Toastmasters. Good morning. Welcome to our meeting this morning. 
Well, there are many different club cultures, and before I decided on taking up Redwood City Orators, I had actually visited several other clubs to see how their culture fit in with me, whether it was the time, the location, the group of people, the type of camaraderie that they had, that was important for me. This is a community club as opposed to a business club, so therefore the topics are much broader. Um, Sarah Palin recently finished her book, and she entitled it Going Rogue in American Life. Now, why do you suppose she chose that particular title for her book? I love this. It, it's like family here. Well, I certainly think that we are free to choose topics that might be considered sensitive in other environments. But because we know each other well, we feel free to express those kinds of things without concern about criticism. We also thought that the world only was around for 4,000, 6,000 years, not long at all. And it was created for us. Our second speaker this morning is David Ammon. And this is a non-manual speech, David? As is the rule of our club, if you do have a non-manual speech, it is up to the evaluator to decide what you're going to be meeting as an objective. I got fed up one time with people who were just doing non-manual speeches. So I decided at the last minute when I was an evaluator for somebody, I thought, okay. And so I stood up and I said, well, so-and-so is going to be giving a speech today and I'm their evaluator and these are their objectives. And before I knew it, everybody else who had to evaluate a non-manual speech started following what I had already decided to do. So it's become a club tradition. And what that has done is has actually brought people back into using manual speeches. I was dating a lady and she was a member and we were you know, going out together and she said, I'm going to Toastmasters and you're coming. I didn't have much choice in that. Well, I had decided finally to start my business again and realized that I needed to A, have an outlet that was helping me focus on presenting my business to improve my presentations and then also to keep me busy. So I decided, well, let's try Toastmasters. Uh, my wife, Carmel, had been with the club for about a year and she suggested that I join and it seemed like a good idea. And so I just went ahead and, and joined Toastmasters at that point and I have never looked back. I really, really enjoyed this experience. Congratulations for the best answer to I, that question. Of by the way, I did marry her and she's now my wife. Welcome back. It's time to hear a prepared speech from an experienced Toastmaster. Our featured speech speaker today is Lisa Stapleton. Lisa Stapleton's speech title is The Monsters Are Closer Than We Think. The monsters are closer than we think. Please welcome Lisa Stapleton. Thank you, Tony. When I was little, my dad used to take me and my brother to every terrible horror movie there was. We saw The Thing and we saw The Blob. Those are normal pictures, but we even saw some of the ones that make it on the top lists of worst horror films, like The Attack of the Mushroom People. <laughs> yes, there really was such a thing. My mother, in an effort to calm us down after these incidents of child abuse by my father, <laughs> would say, don't worry, honey. You know, there aren't really monsters. They're not real. Well, I believed it when I was little, but I don't believe it anymore because of what happened to Fluffy when I was 15. <laughs> Fluffy was a cat that had adopted us, but he wasn't what you'd think. I mean, somebody with the name of Fluffy, you think little and cute and a little furball. Fluffy was nothing like that. Fluffy was old and cranky and skinny, and he had one remaining tooth in his entire mangy head by that point. He was always tearing up our flower gardens and destroying our trees. So I admit, I did not like Fluffy, but nobody deserves what happened to Fluffy. My brother and I were stuck, uh, one, one year, uh, we ended up getting a strange, mysterious knock on our door. And when we got there, 
There was nothing there except a basket with something wrapped in a blanket. It was a, a, a whole pile of zucchini. I guess they wrapped it in the blanket so that we would think it was something slightly less inconvenient, like, I don't know, a baby or something. <laughs> we put it aside. We forgot about it. A few months later, we discovered it. And it looked like an ad for a horror movie that I'd seen called It's Alive that had a baby in a ba baby's bassinet, but instead of the baby's hand hanging out, there was a claw. We screamed, ew, and tossed it out onto the compost pile and forgot about it until spring. Well, in spring, it started to come up, so we thought, oh, we're renewed. We have a second chance. And we thought we'd baby this thing along. Baby was not the right approach for this thing. First, it climbed up the trellis. Then it climbed up, spreading out over our house. It had these weird orange flowers. And it gave our whole house this kind of orange, Italianate, Adams family look to it. <laughs> we were coping, though, until one night when my parents left my brother and me at home watching our tiny, uh, watching our young uh, cousin, Chester. Now, Chester's the one who came up with the best name for this thing. He called it Godzilla Squash. And as soon as our parents left, we ran out the door and we started pulling all the little seedlings that this thing was producing. So at least we wouldn't have to have zucchini in our ice cream next year. <laughs> We were out there working, and all of a sudden, I looked around, and I said, Larry, where's Chester? We started looking around. I started combing through the zucchini. The spines were ripping my hands. I was starting to get blood all over my legs as I ran through this, this field of zucchini in our yard. And then I saw Chester. It had him. It was like alien, only instead of trying to get out, it was trying to get in. This giant blossom had wrapped itself all over Chester's face. I tore the vines from around poor little Chester who was screaming for help. I started to run with Chester out of the zucchini patch and my brother yelled, oh my gosh, it's got him. And I said, no, I've got Chester, he's right here. And he said, no, it's got Fluffy. We looked and sticking out of the zucchini squash was one little mangy paw. <laughs> At that point, Chester said, we've got to do something. This thing is out of control. I said, think, calm down. It's probably not as bad as we think. And then that's when Larry said, no, no, it's mad. I can tell. We've got to do something now before it consumes the entire house. This means squash aside. <laughs> so we ran through the fields. We pulled the vines out. We stacked them in this giant pile. We lit them on fire with roaming candles and firecrackers until it, it, it went up in this giant pyre, which we hoped would solve the problem. Then we took all of the zucchini children and we, we, we stacked them in a large pile. And it was like an assembly line. Cut, core, stick in the firecrackers, light them, boom! Repeat process, oh, six or seven hundred times. At the end of it, we were covered in zucchini slime from head to foot. It was a, it was a field littered with the carnage of the great zucchini squash battle. When our parents came home, we tried to pretend nothing had happened. But we finally had to confess at least to pulling up the squash. But the following year, my dad came in from the yard in March and said, you know, there's the strangest kind of weed coming up in the yard. I looked at my brother. My brother looked at me. 
We both looked at Chester. We ran out to the yard to see thousands of tiny little zucchini seedlings that had been scattered all <laughs> over the yard. I said, Dad, would you believe birds? I think he was a little bit suspicious, but the lesson I learned that Halloween or that summer was that the monsters are closer than we think. And it's not the pumpkin that we should fear at Halloween, but another type of squash altogether. Mr. Toastmaster. Lisa. <laughs> Lisa, time for a short interview. Lisa, what is your home club? Scumbats, which is Santa Clara University MBA Toastmasters. I'm glad you explained that. How long have you been a Toastmaster? Off and on for about 20 years, of probably about eight years altogether. Do you have any advice for an up-and-coming Toastmaster? The most important thing is to start. Thank you. Let's give her a hand. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Now it's time to hear from her evaluator. Her evaluator comes from the Electric Toasters in Palo Alto. Please welcome Molly Dahl. Lisa, I loved your speech. You absolutely exceeded my expectations. I didn't expect quite so much drama. You told me it was an entertaining speech, that it was a tall tale, and oh yes, it was very tall. <laughs> <laughs> I loved your introduction. I found that your eye contact with everybody, your facial expressions, everything that you did got me so caught up into it that I almost forgot to take notes. That's a really good speech. The one, maybe two little critiques that I would give you would be that as I watched how you interacted with the audience, you were almost looking over them as if you were thinking about something else. Or one of the things they tell you, not in Toastmasters, but in speech class and whatnot, is to look over everybody so that you don't get distracted by somebody rubbing their nose or whatever. But it's a little bit disconcerting when you're in the, uh, that audience and you're expecting the Toastmaster approach. The other thing is, it was almost too over the top. But in general, I absolutely loved the story. It got kind of lost in a speech and was more, more of a dramatic production than a, than a speech was. But what I loved most about the story were the twists. The zucchini baby thing with the basket, that caught me by surprise. I'm one of those people who likes to read books, watch a movie, not scary ones, or listen to a speech and be surprised by the ending. And you did that. I absolutely love to be surprised. And by the time you got around to talking about Fluffy again, I'd forgotten about her or him. The best part was the ending. I always tell people in my club that when you are doing a speech, you need to memorize your introduction, your transition points, and your conclusion. And you really surprised me with the conclusion. Here I am repeating myself as far as surprise go. But what you did was tie in a title that I was remembering in the back of my mind, trying to figure out how it fit into the speech and you tied it in beautifully, and I loved it. I'd love to hear you again anytime. Mr. Thanks. Toastmaster. Thank you, Molly. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed what you saw today. See how we turned something that brings fear to a lot of people, public speaking, into something that's fun. Everybody here in the audience at one time came to Toastmasters for different re reasons. But many of them come be just for that very fact that they were just a little nervous in getting up in front of a group. And that first exercise you saw, table topics, where we had people talk about off-the-cuff topics, is really applicable in real life. When was the last time you attended a job interview and you were really nervous? 
this table topics exercise can help you with that. Now, if you're on the other end, asking questions, being a table topics master helps you learn to ask a more direct question and try to get the answer you want. So it's a two-way thing. And that's the way a Toastmasters club works, is folks helping one another. So we have experienced Toastmasters, we have new Toastmasters, and everybody in the club has something to offer. So if you want to learn a little bit more in detail about the makeup of District 4, which is over 200 clubs, starting in San Francisco, going through Mid Peninsula, going over Highway 17, San Jose, Monterey, <laughs> over 200 clubs, and fantastic companies such as eBay, Gilead, Genentech, Wells Fargo's Bank, a lot of major companies, of course, community clubs. They belong to a club called San Mateo Toastmasters, which is a fun community club. Please visit d4tm.org, district4toastmasters.org is what it means. And if you want to learn a little bit more about the world of Toastmasters, an organization represented in over 106 countries, over 250,000 members worldwide, go to Toastmasters.org and learn about the world of Toastmasters. So please have a safe and fun Halloween. Halloween, happy Halloween from District 4 Toastmasters. <laughs>